Um, let's see. It's not working. Okay, don't need to see that. The name of this module is not module name. Um, the name of this module is inferring copy number changes from high density genotyping arrays. And um, I'll just start with uh, giving you a little bit of background of, of what I do and, and where I come from. So my lab is in Vancouver at the BC Cancer Agency and um, I'm affiliated with the University of British Columbia and uh, okay. my appointment's in the Department of Pathology there and uh, I have a cross appointment in the Department of Computer Science. And so not surprisingly I really operate at the interface of um, of these two fields, um, cancer genomics, where I study um, mutational profiles of different cancers, uh, as well as tumor evolution. And in the fields of computer science, um, in the topics of machine learning, statistical models, algorithms, and, and data analysis. And, and really, um, the, these two um, once disparate fields are, are of course, overlapping in a, in a major way these days, and, and it's probably one of the reasons why, why you're all here. Um, cancer genomics has become, well, in genomics in general, has become a quantitative science and necessitates the use of uh, sophisticated computational analysis to make sense of huge amounts of data that are being generated. So, so this, is, this is where I operate. Um, and a couple of people, you may recognize some faces. Um, Jamie and Carrie are in my group, and they're, they're here somewhere, I think. Where are they? They are. They probably thought it started at two as well. <laughs> Maybe I gave them this. Maybe they gave, I gave them this information. Um, they're usually very dependable people. Um, in any case, uh, so I have a, a group of, uh, of about five or six grad students and uh, a few po postdoctoral fellows. Robert, it, Robert's a colleague in a in a different lab. So nice. Um, good. Okay, so, so that's enough uh, of the introduction uh, about me. Um, I guess one thing that uh, could be considered special about me is uh, I spent uh, a few years being a bohemian jazz musician, uh, having nothing to do with science, and uh, that was fun. Okay, so, so here we are. Um, uh, today's uh, topics, we'll, we'll go through some major, major topics, and I'm really going to talk about uh, copy number alterations in cancer and some of the some of the biological relevance and impact of that. Um, why we should study copy number changes in, in tumors. Um, I'll go over a little bit about the measurement technologies that exist today for studying copy number changes, um, and uh, and then we'll go into some details on uh, high density genotyping array analysis. And. Uh, Ultimately, uh, we'll talk about really three topics, uh, which is uh, pre-processing and normalization, uh, segmentation, and, and, and then how to interpret those, those segments from, from this analysis. And this is really the, the, the guts of it, and this is what we'll talk about in the lab. So some of you, um, I should actually probe, I mean, how many people come from a biology background? Almost all of you? Okay, good. Um, any oncology, pathology specialists in the, in the crowd? Couple, okay, pretty good. Um, any analytical, computational people in the crowd? Okay, excellent, excellent, good. Okay, so we have a nice mix of people. I'm going to probably touch on something for everyone in this topic. So um, hopefully some of you may be familiar with, with a picture like this. Uh, this is a spectral karyogram, um, and, and it depicts a normal human karyotype. And really the, the important point here is that our DNA in all of our cells is neatly organized into 23 pairs of chromosomes, 22 autosomes, and, and then two sex chromosomes. So we really have two copies of our genome um, at, uh, at, at neatly packed into these, these chromosomal arrangements. So as early as the early 1900s, um, Bovary suggested that, in fact, um, the distribution of chromosomes uh, may actually affect how a cell proliferates. And, and 
he says that we start with the assumption that the qualities of malignant cells have their own origin in a defect that exists within them. So he had some very insightful views very early on that, in fact, disruption of the, of, of the genome itself, so a misconfiguration of the genome, um, can lead to abnormal behavior uh, in terms of cell growth and cell proliferation. So he studied sea urchin cells, and that really led him to believe that uh, a, a, an abnormal distribution of chromosomes in the cells um, can lead to cellular proliferation. And that gave him the insight that, in fact, um, the content of the chromosomes can be, is actually different. Um, and so uh, having extra copies of particular chromosomes is what led to um, uh, seeing cells that were basically um, proliferating in an uncontrolled manner. So it wasn't until 1960 that he was actually proven correct with the discovery of the Philadelphia chromosome CML. And, uh, and this is an abnormal chromosome um, resulting from translocation of two chromosomes that essentially creates a chimeric protein that's an oncogene. And so, um, so, so this is just gives you a historical context that people have been thinking about how chromosomes um, are organized uh, and, and how they lead to cancer for a very, very long time. So this is a depiction of six different high-grade serous cancers of the ovary. Um, and you can see that this picture looks very, very different than the picture I showed you before. Um, there are numerous chromosomes that have multiple copies um, here and here. Um, there are some chromosomes that are missing arms. There are chromosomes that are fused together with two different colors here. Um, and so these genomes are highly disrupted. So cancer genomes, and it's really almost the property of, of, of nearly all cancer genomes, have completely abnormal karyotypes and, and missegregation of chromosomes and, and a different distribution of chromosomes uh, is a hallmark feature of, of most cancers. So copy number variations, or CNBs, are essentially very simply defined as losses or gains of genetic material. And so um, this is actually from a, from a germline perspective. Uh, whereby um, we have the alleles of the, of the parents here um, coming together to form uh, the, the genome of, of, a, of a child. And, um, and so sometimes what can happen is that um, we'll get uh, a de novo loss of a, of a particular genetic marker here. So this would be considered a deletion. Sometimes we can get a gain of, of material as is depicted here. And, and then sometimes we can get um, a deletion and, and duplications uh, in, in, the following, in the following way. You guys are late. <laughs> I was late too, it's OK. <laughs> um, OK, so, so that gives you an example of, of, uh, of the types of events in a very simple schematic um, diagram that we're trying to depict. So this is some, uh, some real data. Uh, from a thousand breast cancers, and this shows you the how just how disrupted um, breast cancer genomes actually are. And so what, I've, what I'm showing here is um, red going up shows you the frequency in the population of a thousand tumors of how often a given locus is is amplified, so how many times it's duplicated, and and the chromosomes are just arrayed on the bottom here. So this this region here just depicts chromosome one. So this is chromosome one Q. Um, is probably the most frequent event happening in almost 50% of all breast cancers. Um, same can be said of chromosome 8Q. Um, and then we have uh, very frequent deletion events here on 1P, 8P, and, and 16P. And, and so you can see that um, in a, in, if we took this same picture at, in normal genomes, it would generally be, generally be in about 98% of the genome would just be flat. Um, there would be no changes at all. So, um, so the somatically acquired, these are somatically acquired um, changes in, in cancers um, show a, a really severe disruption. And, and this is really called the, the landscape, uh, if you will, of, uh, of the genome. So any questions so far? Okay. So the major reason why we want to study these copy number changes is that they actually disrupt normal cellular behavior. So here are just um, three examples of the types of, of things I've been talking about, just depicted in a different way. So here's the deletion where we have three genes uh, in this region here, and, and this shows a deletion here. 
Um, here we have a, a copy number change, which is just duplication or, or, or um, many copies of a particular gene. And then you can have whole uh, regions that um, undergo segmental duplication like this. Um, and, and here's just what that looks like on a chromosome. And um, so you can imagine that if you have uh, a gene contained in here where there's a deletion, um, and let's say there's a tumor suppressor that's harbored in there, and that genetic material is no longer available, and that gene just doesn't get expressed and doesn't get made into protein, then that function of that tumor suppressor is gone, and then um, the, that whatever uh, repression uh, function that had is also lost. Um, amplifications is the opposite, so if you have a growth factor, let's say, within an amplification, you get multiple copies, um, then there are more copies of that gene that, that are expressed and more, more copies of the protein that are get made. So this is called the gene dosage effect. And um, essentially, the, the, the major focus that we want to try to find is that um, the, the CNAs that can lead to adverse expression changes of targeted genes. And, and ultimately, um, these copy number changes can be used for diagnostics and prognostics. So uh, in CML, it's a classic feature. This PCR able is a, is a translocation. It's not a copy number change, but it's a translocation that basically is, it defines the disease. Um, we can look for gene disease associations and, and targets for therapeutics, which I'll talk about as well. So I would say that there are really three main types of CNBs. Um, can talk about congenital abnormalities. So these are um, uh, CNBs that people are born with. And um, a classic example is trisomy 21. So we have an extra copy of, of 21 that, that uh, causes Down syndrome. There are other CNBs um, implicated in mental retardation and autism. Um, we can have somatic alterations, which are basically acquired over the course uh, of a cell's life. And um, they're tissue specific. They're not, you're not, these are changes that one is not born with, um, and, uh, and really these are a feature of most, if not all, cancers. Then we can have benign variations, which are just polymorphisms in the genome that make two people different. Um, these are just uh, a classic um, uh, a type, classic type of human variation that really wasn't appreciated or discovered until about uh, really five or six years ago. Um, and it, contributes at least as much as single nucleotide polymorphisms to human variation. So, um, yes? So, in these cases, you're observing uh, polymorphisms that are about one kilobyte in size, sort of the larger Correct. <clears throat> it's an arbitrary number, the 1 kb, but that's basically the standard, is that um, anything below that is really considered a, a sequence level change that um, we'll discuss tomorrow. Um, but these are these are sort of more, more gross changes that uh, are considered structural alterations of the genome. And, and the convention is to talk 1 kb, but that's really an arbitrary dimension. Okay. Okay, so now focusing in on the cancer type, so, so really there are uh, uh, three different types of uh, alterations that, that I'd like to discuss. Um, the first is uh, segmental aneuploidies, and these are usually uh, large scale, so often whole chromosome or chromosomal arm length events. These are giant events that really contain all the genes within them. Those are much more difficult to interpret because you can imagine that the gene dosage effect of every single gene in a chromosome arm would be affected. Um, and so, so focusing down on what functional impact of those um, large scale changes would be difficult. Um, however, a lot of cancers uh, exhibit focal copy number changes um, whereby um, the change will target uh, one or just a few genes. And these can really be good indicators of so-called driver events. Have we gone over the driver, passenger? Okay, probably ad nauseum at this point. So, <laughs> okay, so this is, um, uh, the, these can really be good indicators uh, of events, driver events. Um, and then finally we have uh, rearrangements whereby um, the parts of one chromosome fuse to a different um, chromosome. 
These are called translocations, and often they induce what we call gene fusions. And they can create chimeric proteins whereby you have a protein that's half of one gene and half of another gene that does not endogenously occur in normal cells. And so these are um, uh, BCR able again as a different as another example as an example of this. And, and I've done some work in, in gene fusions, uh, gene, gene fusion discovery as well. Um, and so um, gene fusions are. Uh, are highly sought after. Again, another example that's just been discovered, I would say, you know, in 2005, Tom Lins et al. reported, et al. reported gene fusion in prostate cancer uh, as being 50% uh, uh, current in, in prostate cancer, and, and, and it's implicated as really a, a very important um, driving event in prostate cancer. So, um, and with next-gen sequencing technology, more gene fusions are being discovered um, almost on a daily basis, you can see in the literature. So, um, so this is, these are important. Uh, I don't think we're talking about gene fusions in the in this workshop, but uh, uh, nonetheless, it's an important consideration. Um, okay, so here's an example. Yes. Snips. Snips definitely can. Um, so we're. That's tomorrow's topic, but um, but uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, so we know about hereditary breast cancers, um, certainly, and, and other forms of cancers as well exhibit um, a, a lar very large um, hereditary component. Um, and breast cancers have been localized to uh, BRCA1 and 2, whereby uh, po inherited polymorphisms actually uh, disrupt those genes and, and, and give it sus susceptibility. Yeah. I've heard that SNPs are mostly uh, concerned with normal Well, so so I think what you're getting at is the difference between germline polymorphisms and somatic changes. Is that is that correct? Yeah. So so you can think about hereditary cancer and sporadic cancer. Hereditary cancer has a familial component to it, whereby genetics, um, basic genetics, play a, play a role, and, and it's actually um, the, the susceptibility is passed down through hereditary means. Whereas sporadic cancers, um, there's no genetic, genetic factor, and, and people could speculate that it's actually env environmental causes that, that will initiate the initial um, mutation. But in fact, I mean, we're, all, we're all walking around with a lot of mutations. Um, and if we all lived long enough, we'd all die of cancer because mutations accumulate over time. Um, and so uh, essentially, um, uh, somatic mutations occur um, stochastically and randomly over the course of one's life. Um, and they're di quite distinct from germline polymorphisms, which have uh, the genetic component to it. Okay. Well, no, I know it varies from tumor type to tumor type of breast cancer. What's the percent again? 20%. Okay. All right, so, so here's an example of um, so another 20% of breast cancers are, uh, are affected by this. This is a somatic change um, in chromosome 17 that affects the ERB2 locus, they're also called HER2. Um, and this is probably the single greatest um, success story in targeted cancer therapy that exists. Um, this gene is a growth factor and, uh, and it stimulates growth. And essentially there's, um, in the 90s, uh, uh, between Dennis Lehman and, and a company called Genentech, um, a targeted therapy was developed for this particular event. Um, and you can see that basically what I'm showing here is that um, uh, the number of copies of this gene is essentially on the y-axis and, and the locus uh, 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 where it sits on the chromosomes on the x-axis. So, so these are um, essentially where you have no change compared to a reference, or you can imagine this as a diploid region, and this is a diploid region here, and then you have a massive amplification of, of HER2, so you have many, many, many copies. It gets expressed, it gets made into protein. Um, the, uh, through the development of an antibody, though, however, this can be inhibited. And so the 20% of breast cancer patients, everyone gets tested for uh, the uh, abundance or expression of this protein when, when they're diagnosed with breast cancer. And if they have high levels, then they're immediately prescribed a drug called Herceptin, which is developed by Genentech. 
and, um, and what used to be essentially a death sentence uh, for this type of cancer now has a very favorable outcome um, under, under Herceptin. Um, so, so really this is uh, uh, targeted therapy um, that started about 20 years ago. So here's uh, some evidence of, um, from real data. Again, this is that same data set of 1,000 breast cancers that I was talking about. We're on the x-axis. We plot the level of uh, genome copies, the number of, uh, uh, essentially, the, the um, you can imagine this is the number of copies in the genome. And we had matching gene expression data from the transcriptome. Um, we could then correlate um, whether changes in the genome actually translated into changes in the transcriptome. You can see for, for ERB2, um, these are the patients that have amplifications in red. Uh, there's a very nice correlation there. Um, this gene is next door to it as well. This is GRAB7. People have speculated that um, actually GRAB7 is also an oncogene. Um, and, and, and you can see that it, it is actually affected um, dramatically by uh, the copy number change as well. So the copy number change actually here often spans just more than HER2. Um, it also includes some neighboring genes and, and usually contains some anywhere between three and, and, and eight genes around it. So the surrounding genes are actually often affected as well. Here's another locus that's commonly affected in breast cancer. This is the CCND1 locus. Um, and you can see that a very similar trend is affected. Okay, so, so copy number changes um, can, and usually the focal ones, um, affect gene expression. And that consequently affects how much protein is made uh, in the cellular function. So those are amplifications. Here's an example of a deletion. I hope you can see this. Um, so this is the gene uh, P10. It's a tumor suppressor gene. And um, what's shown here is just a part of this chromosome. Sorry, the exact location isn't, isn't marked here. But it's basically a zoomed in region. You can see the dotted lines uh, represent the boundaries of P10. And the bright green represents a two copy deletion. So where, whereby that gene is just completely obliterated. It's no longer there. Um, and so uh, patients with, um, we, we, we think that P10 is a, 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 a very early initiating event in these tumors. And um, it's not a huge percentage of, of patients that exhibit P10 in breast cancer, but, um, but nonetheless is targeted by copy number changes uh, to inactivate the protein. Okay. So we've seen one example of an oncogene, ERB2, that gets amplified. Now we're seeing this is an example of a tumor suppressor, which gets deleted. So, so just going back to that one KB arbitrary distinction, um, it, it's basically changes more copies um, uh, of a particular segment of the genome um, that are greater than one KB, more or less copies. But it's changed, as you mentioned, yeah. Was the definition based on the resolution of the technology correct. at that point? That's, that's, that's absolutely correct. Um, so it does, and it, and it said it's an arbitrary um, distinction. And so, so ultimately, an insertion and deletion is, is a copy number variation, um, just that um, base pair resolution, basically. So, so you, could, you could actually make the distinction. Maybe it's more appropriate to say larger than base pair resolution changes. Okay, so, so then here are a list of, um, of genes that have been uh, found over the years to be uh, affected by amplifications and deletions. So RB2, I mentioned, EGFR is a, is a close cousin of RB2, the epidermal growth factor receptor, um, the MYC oncogene, PI3 kinase, um, IGF1R, FGFR1, 2, and, and the KRAS protein. Um, deletions are uh, have been recurrently found uh, in many cancers. RB1, which is the, the classic retinal blastoma gene. Yes. I was just wondering how, how much is known about the structure of um, amplification. In in what sense? Um, well, okay. So if I'm envisioning a deletion, it's not too hard to do. Actually, an exception that's that's missing. Two ends mm -hmm. are fused together. Um, yeah. But in an amplification. So, so, so you can imagine during, 
Yeah, so you can imagine during replication there's a bit of a stutter step. Um, so so that a, a piece of the chromosome will just get um, stutters, essentially replicated like this as, as the, it's being copied uh, from one cell to another. Um, but in terms of, in, so then there's um, homologous end joining and non homologous end joining and, and those different processes um, that, that lead to this as well. Um, so it, th there's, there's quite a bit known. Um, probably won't elaborate much more than that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so these uh, proteins here are, are known to be affected by deletions. Um, and then I'd encourage you uh, to, to read these papers if you haven't already. Um, these are uh, recent high-resolution interrogation of somatic copy number landscapes. Um, this paper here uh, from B Bignell et al. Um, looked at uh, the cosmic resource of about 700 different cell lines um, from various different cancers and profiled them all with affymetric SNP6 arrays um, and, uh, and defined um, uh, recurrent changes across all these cell lines and identified um, some novel tumor suppressors. Um, uh, this paper here, uh, Barukim et al. Uh, uh, in Nature uh, from Matt Marison's group um, looked at uh, uh, more than 3,000 tumors um, on a slightly lower resolution platform, but again from across all tumor types, and, and, and identified um, some interesting patterns across tumor types. And then finally, we have some tumor specific um, interrogations uh, the TCGA glioblastoma data set. Um, which you may have uh, visited already, um, and the recent ovarian, uh, high-grade serous uh, ovarian uh, paper uh, discusses um, at least 300 tumors in, uh, from these different tumor types profiled with high-resolution uh, SNP genotyping arrays. Um, and uh, I hope to, next time I, I, I see you in this course, would uh, be able to talk about this uh, thousand tumors that we've been um, we're very close to being published okay, in breast cancer. Okay, so um, here's a list of, um, I could just look at this section of this table here. Um, these are uh, genes that are undergoing copy number changes, somatic copy number changes in cancers um, that have actually have, um, for the most part, uh, therapies that can be administered to inhibit the proteins. Oops. Something happened. I may have hit, hit the switch there. Oh, there we go. That was easy. Don't touch. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you put a glass barrier here. Yeah. Close. Is there a door? There are doors. Okay. There we go. Okay, excellent. That won't happen again. Um, the um, is the microphone off? The microphone's off. Yeah. I can speak loudly. Um, just let me know if you can't hear me. So, um, so what I was uh, discussing, so here, here is the example I was talking about. So trastuzumab is, is Herceptin. It's the, the scientific name for Herceptin. Um, and, and there are other uh, drugs such as uh, erlotinib that targets uh, EGFR and uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors that, that target um, uh, PIK3CA. So these are, in fact, um, clinically important and clinically actionable events in cancer. And, and really, this is, this is um, e eventually why we're all working hard to try to discover these changes, is that so um, inhibitors and therapies can be designed around them. And, um, and the list, as you can see, is really quite small. Uh, when you look at um, the, the landscape of breast cancer, a huge part of the genome is affected by these changes. Uh, and we've got a, 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 a list almost that you can count on your hand of genes that we can actually target. So, so that's um, why a lot of us are, are, are in this area to try to discover these, um, these changes. Okay, so have we talked about uh, genotypes, Francis? Not really. Okay. So uh, 
genotype is, is best um, described as, uh, 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 as, as you get one copy from your, you get one copy of a genome from your mother, one copy from your father, and they can differ. Um, and um, if they're the same, then, then we call, uh, just look at this, this here. Okay, so let's say we have a, a single nucleotide polymorphism at a given locus. Um, its genotype is, is AA. Um, if uh, the major allele from the mother and, and the major allele from the father is present in the child. And, and it, it's also the same if, if for minor alleles, um, it's BB. And if it's a heterozygous um, position, then it's, then it's AB. Okay? So this is the, the standard state. So you can imagine if you get deletion of one copy of, of your genome, then, then you basically don't have um, two copies to talk about anymore. You just have one. So it can be either A or B. Um, then let's look at a, a single copy, single copy uh, duplication, where now all of a sudden we have three copies. Oh, there we go. It's back on. Um, three copies of the uh, of the genome, and and they can take four possibilities. Okay, so we have triple A, AAB, ABB, and BBB. Does it does this make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, excellent. And then, and then, et cetera, you can, and as you increase the number of copies, the number of possible genotypes changes as well, okay? Um, so, so what's particularly important here is this line here, copy neutral loss of heterozygosity. So you can imagine that um, there may be a deleterious allele um, that's essentially protected by a normal allele. Um, and if that normal allele is, is gone, um, and only the, the only one copy of the deleterious allele is expressed, then we might have some functional effect. Um, similarly, here deletion of one copy is is also loss of heterozygosity because you only have one copy left, and this is exactly what led um, to the discovery of the retinoblastoma uh, a gene um, way back when. When Newton noticed that, in fact, um, and it's a very rare form of cancer that there's there's actually a a, a two Event hypothesis, uh, two event uh, system whereby one allele is uh, is has a has a mutation in it, and the other one is subsequently lost um, uh, through somatic uh, mutation, and um, and so so that rendered uh, uh, that protein um, completely gone. So so loss of heterozygosity analysis is, is important. And, um, and can actually give clues in the context of mutations as to which mutations might be actually under this, this two-hit idea. Yes? And loss of is just considered true loss of and your That's right. <clears throat> That's exactly right. To be, to, well, so it's not loss of heterozygosity if you didn't have heterozygosity to begin, to begin with, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so, so here's an example of what this looks like in action. So, so here we have um, a picture of uh, an array, and each black dot represents a probe on the array, and, it, and it's physically ordered on the chromosome. And, and we can see a few different events here. So here's a copy number gain. Okay, you can see that that, um, that creates, induces four copies, and they can be detected by the different genotypes that are induced by that. So, so here we have examples of, of all four, uh, sorry, all five resulting genotypes. Okay, um, there's uh, an example here where we have uh, no, no evident change in, uh, in the genome uh, at a copy number level, however, um, there's no evidence of, of heterozygosity here. So this is what we call copy neutral heterozygosity, loss, loss of heterozygosity. Um, and then this, is, this region is really the, the normal state where you should see um, uh, at different loci uh, AA, AB, or BB. Okay, so this is the normal state, and then these two regions are really the abnormal states. Okay, so why should we uh, model alleles in cancer? Well, I alluded to this a little bit um, before, but um, essentially, 
Um, this is the, uh, a picture from um, this very nice review paper. I, I uh, encourage you to read this. This is actually, um, Newton is the, the second author on this paper. Um, and, and so he, it's really kind of a follow-up to his um, uh, two-hit hypothesis 40 years later. Um, and he's refined it quite a bit. Um, so, so this is uh, quite an interesting read. It's a review paper. Um, so, so essentially what we have is we have two alleles. Um, they're, they're really kind of um, three different paradigms. So if, if we have two alleles, um, then, then in, in this two-hit paradigm, then we have no phenotype. If we lose one, then we have some, some cancer susceptibility. Uh, and if we lose two, then, then that initiates uh, uh, tumor genesis. And we get, um, uh, uh, and this is, this is what happens in rep retinoblastoma. Um, in this paradigm here, we have what's called haploinsufficiency. And that means that um, once you lose an allele, that can already, one allele, that can already be enough um, to initiate uh, cancer. And, and basically, as, as we lose, um, uh, in terms of expression, as we lose um, more of the protein, then the severity of the, d of the disease increases. Um, so, so a particular protein that's um, sub subject to haploid insufficiency is p53. Um, then we go on to um, uh, what we call what what he calls uh, quasi sufficiency or obligate haploid obligate haplo haplo insufficiency, and this is where um, as we start to lose um, copies uh, in in the expression of these alleles. Um, the severity of the disease increases until um, a point it reaches a point where we have to have some of the protein around in order for the cell to actually survive. And, and so that's why it's called obligate haploinsufficiency. So you have to have a little bit of the protein remaining in order for those cells to function properly. Otherwise, even the tumor cells will die. Okay, so, so measuring alleles essentially um, can reveal uh, these type, different types of genes that, that may undergo these different um, uh, characteristics in terms of um, uh, heterozygosity. So, yes? Um, in the case of the P10, you have mm -hmm. initially shown that at least in breast cancer that it's basically deleted. Yeah. So, so is there an example of this? Um, so, so he talks about... Um, so, uh, sir, what's your name? Fias. So Fias was just mentioning that. So I, I, I showed some pictures of homozygous deletions of P10, which effectively suggests that, that the protein is no longer there. And that really conflicts with this idea of, of obligate haploinsufficiency. Um, and so um, uh, he does discuss uh, certain examples in different cancers of, of this, this phenomenon. And it's not true, um, it doesn't have to be true Different characteristics can be um, uh, different in different in different cancers. So this may only be true in certain certain types of cancers, and not so in other types of cancers. Okay, so let's um, spend a bit of time on uh, measurement technologies. So essentially, we have uh, you know, an increasing resolution here. Um, we go from uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization. What this is, is uh, it's, it's a very um, elegant way of targeting just one region uh, with probes and essentially allows probes, um, fluorescently labeled probes, to work their way into the nucleus, uh, whereby um, we can measure copies of, a particular, of that probe uh, within actual cells. And so using microscopy and, and fluorescence, um, you can basically uh, get the probe inside the nucleus. And, and here, what's being shown is each blue blob here is, is essentially a nucleus. And, um, and then the, the, the control probe um, is green. And so you can see that a lot of cells have two green blobs. And then the, um, the actual uh, uh, testing probe is red. And this is actually a, a, an insulin receptor amplicon that we found in a, in a particular breast cancer. And you can see that there, the number of, of red dots um, greatly exceeds the number of, of green dots. And this is really a low throughput um, but highly reliable validation technique um, for looking for copy number changes. And this is often used in the clinic to, um, to detect HER2. Okay. So, so moving from this very low throughput technology, um, but, but clinically useful um, technology, we go to uh, uh, what's called array comparative hybridization. So this, this um, technology emerged in, in the early 2000s and essentially can look at about between 30 and 100,000 loci in the genome in parallel. 
And, um, and I'll go over in a bit more detail uh, what this does, but essentially we, we, you can design probes, um, say 100,000 probes, array them on a glass slide, and, uh, and then in parallel you're going to interrogate the number of copies um, of all of those probes, uh, which, where you, which you know where they fit in the genome, um, and then can um, look at patterns across the genome. Um, in the late 2000s, um, very high density genotyping arrays started to emerge really as a consequence of, um, uh, of GWAS studies um, for, for germline her heritable diseases. Um, that's what really drove the technology, um, but, but they're actually they're quite useful for cancer. And um, these, these genotyping arrays can contain up to about 2 million probes um, and, and essentially query um, two alleles at each loci as well. So that's a very big distinction between um, array CGH. And finally, we get into what I call 3G technology. Um, these aren't cell phones, these are genomes. Um, we get to base pair resolution through, through sequencing. And, um, and essentially, uh, we now have the ability, um, which you probably looked at this morning, um, of finding these copy number variations at um, base pair resolution. Um, which is quite astonishing and extraordinary. And so um, at this point, uh, this technology still really costs about, um, say, 10 to 15 times what, um, or maybe 20 times what a, what a high-density genotyping array costs. And so um, the, it's not really um, used in, in large uh, cohort studies. Um, like SNP arrays have been adopted. And, and so, you, so you see in the literature, even emerging today in, in high profile journals, you see um, studies of, of, of a thousand or, or several hundred tumors uh, with SNP genotyping arrays. And we're not there yet with sequencing technology. We're still in the tens um, for, for sequencing technology. Okay, so a little bit on how this works. Essentially, what we do is I, I mentioned that we design probes where we know where they exist on the, on the genome, and we uh, put them on some sort of surface, um, a glass slide that can be uh, where, whereby DNA fragments can be washed over them, and uh, through image processing, very much in the same way that, that a gene expression microarray works. I'm sure Paul went over that. Did, is that yes? Can you confirm that? Okay. So this is very, very similar in nature. Um, and, and, but, but the difference is, is that the dynamic range of, of copies of the genome is considerably less than the dynamic range of, of copies in the transcriptome. And so, um, and, and the other thing is that um, we expect that since um, these aneuploidies or these changes happen in large chromosomal regions, we can expect that adjacent probes will actually exhibit um, similar behavior because you're interrogating many, many probes within a, within a single biological event. And so, so the, the analytical tools are, are obligately different um, for copy number analysis than they are for gene expression analysis. So, so here what, uh, what I'm showing is just a, a result of a chromosome. Um, this purple line represents a no change um, between this and, and either the match normal or, or a pooled normal reference. Um, and then deviations from that uh, can indicate uh, uh, copy number changes. So here's a, basically a chromosomal arm level deletion. Um, and, then, and then here you have um, some amplifications, and here's just a very focal deletion that, uh, if you zoom in on, um, looks like this. And so again, each black dot uh, represents um, essentially the relative copy number of uh, that part of the genome. Um, it's a noisy measurement, but a, a fairly, uh, fairly uh, representative measurement of the copy number. And then here you have a segmental deletion um, that, uh, that, that is exhibited by negative values here. Um, in terms of a, a log space. Okay, so, so this is really what we're trying to find is events like this. Um, and it, this is very low tech um, in today's standards, but it schematically represents the same concept of what we're trying to find. Okay, any questions so far? Good, excellent. Okay, so moving on to high density genotyping arrays. Um, they're really what this uh, comes down to is, is measurement of, of two alleles. So these are 
regions of the genome or specific loci in the genome that we know are uh, variant in the human population. So these can these will have been discovered either by the HapMap project or the Thousand Genomes project um, or projects like that, which are are targeted at um, really dis discovering um, loci in the genome that are frequently variant in the po in the general human population. Um, and and there are about uh, a million of these that are a uh, million loci across the genome that are um, that are measured, and the major and minor alleles um, being, this major being the most frequent, the minor being the less frequent, um, alleles are measured um, essentially separately and independently. And this is really the key distinction between this and, and array CGH. So array CGH, you get a single measurement per locus, and the SNP genotyping arrays, you get two measurements per locus. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes? That's correct. And how are you able to differentiate from one Because it, they're, they're actually independently, um, yeah, they're a different locus, lo, loci in the array. Yeah. Okay, so as I mentioned, the original motivation for design of these arrays was uh, is in the post -genome, human genome era where um, genome wide association studies were, um, were, were widely. Um, carried out, and uh, really this was for associating inherited SNPs with, with human disease. And um, you know, if you track the track the literature from about 2005 through to 2009, um, uh, there are probably about uh, several thousand papers on on genome-wide association studies, um, and they started to emerge in Nature, and then now then Nature Genetics, and now um, now they're probably um, more spread out across more specialized journals. Um, Okay, so um, so that was really the original motivation. That's what drove the development of the technology, um, and and the major vendors during this this time were Illumina and Affymetrics. Um, can very conveniently though um, in cancer it really allows for inference of segmental aneuploidies, um, focal copy number changes as, as we discussed, and loss of heterozygosity uh, and allele specific copy number changes as I mentioned earlier. Um, so, so this has been actually a really, um, although developed for uh, studying uh, hereditary diseases um, in 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 uh, medical applications. Um, the application to cancer uh, has been quite fortuitous and, and, uh, and has actually led to uh, a lot of insights into um, the architecture of cancer genomes. Okay, so there's, that being said, there are considerable challenges uh, of statistical inference um, of biological events from cancer samples. So, um, and, and I'm not sure how much has been discussed um, uh, but I don't think it can be stressed enough that um, studying a cancer genome is very, very different than studying a normal human sample. Okay? Um, and and the, these are the major reasons. Um, first of all is that it's almost um, impossible uh, when extracting DNA from a cancer sample to get an entirely pure set of cells unless you're working with cell lines. Um, and so mixed in with the cancer cells are normal cells that are, come from vasculature. Uh, there are lymphocytes in there. There's stromal contamination. Um, and so uh, necessarily what you're seeing whenever you do a genomics experiment with a cancer sample is a mixture of the normal genome and the cancer genomes. And, um, and I say genomes because, in fact, in many, many different cancers, especially epithelial malignancies, there are so what we call intratumoral heterogeneity. And so um, a cancer sample is not represented by one genome. It's represented by many, many genomes that have diverged over time in an evolutionary or Darwinian process. Um, and, and so there are colonial populations of cells with different genomes. And so not only are we seeing a mixture of normal and tumor cells, we're seeing a mixture of normal and several different um, tumor genomes. Um, and so, so really, most experimental designs don't deal with this at all and consist of a single sample from the tumor. Um, and so, so just be aware of this, that, that it's a great leap of faith to when you're inferring something that, in fact, it's representative of, uh, that you're actually capturing all of the variation that exists within the, within the cancer cells that you're trying to study. So we talked a bit about John, talked about it, and John the cancer. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, well, I'll mention it again tomorrow, <laughs> uh, just in case. Um, so um, the other thing that I want to uh, mention is that, um, and we've discussed this already, is really what we're after in, in many in many contexts, because um, it's it's to study um, hereditary uh, populations. Um, it really requires vast numbers, so huge cohorts to actually get the statistics right. Um, and so often what we're, when, we're, when we're studying tumor samples, which is hard, are often hard to come by, we're really interested in somatic aberrations. And so um, we have to think about um, variations that we see as which ones are somatic and which ones are germline. Okay? So we have to distinguish which ones are tumor cell specific from those that are actually um, just normal human variation that we're born with. This is actually a very important point that is unique to the cancer setting that doesn't come up in, in hereditary studies. Finally, um, uh, many tumor genomes are polyploid, um, or uh, at least at certain chromosomes are polyploid, so they have more than two copies um, of the whole structure. Uh, and so, uh, so that obviously convolutes um, the, the uh, interpretation of, of alleles. Okay, so, so there are three major points that I really want to get across uh, in this lecture. And one is that the assumptions in most statistical software packages ignore at least one of these issues, at least one and most often all. Okay, um, software uh, and statistical models designed for analysis of normal genomes do not generalize to the cancer setting. Okay, so, so pulling a, something off the shelf that's designed for the Thousand Genomes Project does not translate into an effective piece of analytical software for cancer genomes. Um, and so specialized tools for cancer are needed. All right. So with that in mind, um, there's a very nice uh, uh, piece of uh, review paper um, that's come out recently that I would encourage you to read. It talks about these statistical considerations, um, some of them, not all of them, um, in, uh, uh, in, in a very uh, nice and easy to read um, Way. There's a bit of math and, and a bit of notation in there, but I highly encourage you to read um, this, uh, this paper um, in the context of um, how statistical models have been developed in the context of cancer uh, with genotyping arrays. Okay, and we'll touch on some of this, but really um, it, this, these are quite advanced topics that um, for the non-analytically inclined uh, might be difficult to grasp in, in actually hands-on work. Okay, so let's just look at a general workflow for how to process a high-density genotyping array in cancer. So coming off the machine, either Illumina or, uh, or AFI or, or whatever, you get some sort of file. For AFI, it's a cell file. Yes? Um, for the case of the SNPs, uh, the polymorphisms are known and you usually work with the germ like DNA. Well, it depends. Yeah. So that's an excellent question. I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit. They are becoming more and more known. Um, projects like the Thousand Genomes Project and um, and also the HapMap Project have revealed uh, that uh, quite a, quite a large percentage of the genome, far more than was originally thought is under the influence of, um, of copy number variation. Um, that is just germline. It just makes you and I different and, and the person next to you different from yourself. And, and so it's, they're just, these are naturally occurring um, regions of human variation. Um, so that begs the question in the medical community, well, some of these must be um, susceptibility uh, loci as well. And so now what's being done um, here in Toronto and all around the world um, are large-scale studies to, to try to look at hereditary factors um, of particular diseases associated with, with, with copy number variations. Um, and so to answer your question, there, there, are, large, a lot, there are a large amount of um, data resources and databases that are, that are growing. And so when you, often when we look at a somatic change, we can put that into context of what's known in the databases of normal human variation. And, and so if you see a signal in a particular gene and get all excited and say, oh, well, you go look up in the database, okay, well, it's been reported in 30% you know, of, of, of HapMap. So in that case, then that's likely not going to be a somatic mutation, but rather something that's just a, a normal human variation. So 
So, so whenever I hear about the kind of COVID number variation study, I should expect that it's down on the uh, germline DNA? Well, it depends what context. So is it a cancer um, study? The then, then, then no, it should be done on. Well, so if it's a if it's a susceptibility study, then yes, be done on germline. If you're looking for hereditary factors, then certainly should be done on germline DNA. If it's looking for you're looking for somatic changes to define uh, acquired changes that exist only in tumor cells, necessarily has to be from the tumor genomes. Okay, yeah. Most of the studies that I've referenced so far are tumor specific. Isn't it better in most cases to look at both? Absolutely. So, um, so that, that's one of the experimental designs that um, if, if one can afford to, and, and this is by, by far the more um, desired experimental design, is to do paired analysis. So we look at the genome, uh, extract blood from the patient or some sort of germline uh, DNA in, in not, not leukemic patients, obviously, but if you're looking at epithelial cancers, you can get um, a sample of blood or, or, or skin or something like that, hybridize that DNA and compare it to the tumor uh, from the same patient. So that's called a matched tumor normal experimental design. And certainly in sequencing, it's necessary. Otherwise, um, um, yeah, so in, in, in the sequencing context, which I'll talk about tomorrow, um, that's the only experimental design that, um, that I would advocate. Okay. All right, so back to the workflow. So we have um, our file that comes off the machine. And then very similar to uh, gene expression microarrays, uh, really have to go through the the step of pre-processing and normalization in order to get um, um, to deconvolute machine noise from biological signal. And, and then really the, the analysis forks at this point, um, whereby we can, in genotyping arrays, you have the ability to just look at the B allele or the minor allele uh, fraction, uh, and then you can look for loss of heterozygosity. Um, on the, the left, um, we can do total copy number extraction and then look for copy number alterations. Um, and then finally, these two things can come together and we can start to do interpretation uh, based on a gene or pathway or clinical correlations, um, uh, which I think we're going to do on uh, after the session tomorrow. Um, and then Friday, we'll get into uh, clinical um, correlations. So let's look at the specs of Affymetric SNP6. Um, these are essentially 25 oligonucleotide uh, uh, probes, and there are 900,000 um, SNP probes. So these are probes whereby uh, two alleles are measured, okay, and, and there are 25 MERS that differ at the centering base um, at, at, the, at the polymorphic site, okay. And then we have uh, 900,000 CNV probes, and these are um, just, they're not measuring uh, two different SNPs. They're just measuring the, the total copy number at that location. Um, essentially, the way it works is that uh, we measure hybridization intensities similar to micro, uh, gene expression microarrays, and, and you can learn a bit more um, uh, about, about this at the chip definition file site there. Okay, so as I mentioned, normalization uh, is required to remove platform-induced artifacts. Um, my method of choice, and, and I think um, I think it's been the, the best uh, well-developed uh, piece of software, is called Aroma.Affymetrix. There are others, but um, this is the one that I advocate. Um, it's uh, unfortunately um, can be a little bit um, difficult to use for naive users, and that's why we're doing the lab this afternoon. You're going to get your hands dirty with this um, uh, with this uh, suite of of, of tools. Um, so this vignette here describes um, how to use what's called CRMA uh, version 2, and, and really this is the suite of, of functions that um, does a lot of the pre-processing for, uh, for this, and I'll talk about uh, some of them in detail. In my opinion, it really outperforms the commercial software, and, and it has a great benefit of being transparent and open source, um, and so uh, it has a user community, and you can look at the source code, and um, and, and basically, you can output allele-specific and total copy number uh, real value data. Um, and the other thing is that um, it's really uh, developed by, uh, uh, in, in Terry Speed's lab, um, and he's really uh, 
one of the leaders, academic international leaders in, in dealing with microarrays and works with Affymetrics as well. And so there's really quite a, 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 a lot going for this package that, uh, that makes me recommend it. Okay, so um, let's talk about something called allelic crosstalk. So allelic crosstalk occurs when the probe from the major allele mishybridizes to um, uh, DNA from the minor allele and vice versa. Okay, so this is where um, that single nucleotide polymorphism, um, that, that distinction isn't enough and, and you get um, the wrong piece of DNA going to, uh, to, to, the, to the wrong probe. And, and so what's plotted here is, are the intensities of, of, of the two different um, SNPs. And really what you should see is um, you should see a line kind of going across here that represent homozygous regions, um, a line going across here which represent the other homozygous regions, and then a diagonal which represent the heterozygous um, regions. And so you can see that um, this is just basically the, uh, a line fitted to this data. Um, and, and it's not quite vertical, and in this case it's not horizontal. And so, um, uh, so, so uh, this paper describes how to correct for this um, so that, uh, in fact, the signal uh, is more accurate and more representative of what it should be. And um, there are other uh, types of artifacts, such as um, sequence-specific artifacts. So if you have high GC content, the hybridization affinities of those probes are going to be different. And so that needs to be corrected for and then um, there also uh, there's a restriction fragment length um, uh, step, a restriction fragment uh, length uh, step in this in this process, and uh, that uh, also induces um, some artifacts. And so, the aroma uh, CRMA package basically adjusts um, all of these factors um, and and accounts for them so that um, uh, basically we get this is a representation of uh, uh, of the of the intensities um, before. Uh, normalization and, and after. And so you can see here there's this sort of distinct bimodal distribution here and this is really due to allelic crosstalk. And, and, um, and moreover the, the means of all these modes are not quite comparable and so if you want to compare arrays between individuals um, then, then they really need to be normalized and, and so that this is what the picture looks like afterwards. So this is um, essentially a fancy histogram. It's a density plot um, and, and it shows the shape of the, of the total data set. And, and you really want those, the shape of that density plot to be consistent across the different um, individuals that you have in order to, to compare them properly. I'm sure you saw something similar to this in, in the gene expression section. Okay, so once we've pre-processed, then we can go on to inference of genomic features. So, um, so what, what we want to do is uh, we can do look up for look for these three things. So, total copy number, cop the CNAs, loss of heterozygosity, and then the allele specific copy number changes as well. So, so just by way of, of notation, we can represent each one of these uh, each one of these topics here with, uh, with some notation. So, um, y sub j um, uh, super a is the atten intensity for allele a at position j. Okay, so so. So the intensity um, comes from image analysis, and, and um, J is just the genomic position, and then A is basically the allele. And so we get one for the other allele as well. Okay, so, so that, that's what this is, and the total intensity is just the sum of those. Okay, and that's just um, indicated by Y sub J. And then this one's important. Um, this is a total copy number at that position. Um, and what, that, uh, what we usually do is compare what we get from the total intensity of the two alleles to the total intensity from some reference. Okay, and that can be a match normal, that can be a pooled reference, that can be um, the average uh, measurement in, in, in a population of, of tumors. So, so y, uh, yr is, is basically this reference here, and, so, and we multiply that by some constant factor, usually 2, and we'll do that in the lab. Okay? And then often people take the log of that. Um, so that deletions in terms of levels are comparable to amplifications. And, uh, yeah? Yeah, so, so the design of the array usually takes the two most frequent uh, nucleotides. Simple answer. It's just, just it's, bi it's binary in terms of major and minor. And often, actually, there's a, a, 
there's a restriction on the number of nucleotides that can actually be um, vary, var varying in, in population just due to evolutionary constraints. So, so I think that's why the convention of two has been adopted because that's been the most frequent um, uh, number of bases that, that are seen at a given polymorphic site. It can be more, but more, most often it's two. Most often it's one, actually, but then at one in 10,000 sites you get two and then it tails off after that. Okay? Yeah, good. Okay, so um, how do we go from signal to copy number? So, so essentially what we want to do is you can imagine that these dots are, are not colored, okay, um, uh, for a second. And really what we want to try to distinguish is, is are these events that where, where the copy number events change. You can see that it's not as straightforward as just drawing a line and saying all, all points above a certain line are going to be um, copy number changes because there's spatial correlation and, and, and the points next to each other are often the, uh, need to go together and, and in the same copy number call, if you will. And so we have these continuous signals that are really quite noisy and really what we want to do is try to um, make those, uh, those, those points discrete. And so this whole thing, this is one event here, okay? So all of these points can really repre be represented with one single event. And this would be almost a cr like a chromosome arm amplification of, of, uh, of this region. So here's the, here's the banding pattern here, it's a centromere. And so this is the, the a chromosome level event, uh, chromosome arm level event. And we have a little neutral region here. And, and then we've got some copy number uh, amplifications here. And then the green here represents deletions, okay? Now in this case, we do have a match normal. And, and so here's an example of something that um, where, where you need to watch out for. So, so here's a, a, an event that's very obvious. It's a huge deletion. Uh, you might jump up, jump up and down and say, look, I found a tumor suppressor. It's, it's, it's all gone. It's very focal. It's great. But then you look in the normal and say, aha, okay, there, it's there as well. Okay? So, so that means that it's just part of that hum normal human's uh, variation and, and not to be um, uh, considered as, as pathological in the context of cancer. Um, it could be in a heredit hereditary study, but, um, but for the most part in, in uh, somatic uh, studies. This is what, what we're more after is these ones. So you can see in comparison to the normal here, um, these changes are, are quite evident in the tumor and just not at all there in the normal. Okay? So in high density uh, genotyping arrays, we usually talk about six different states. Um, you can talk about more states than that, but um, but generally, uh, in practice, what we found is that these six states really um, uh, represent uh, most of the, uh, of the variation, and so that we have a neutral state where there are no change compared to the reference. Um, we have a hemizygous deletion, which is a single copy loss, homozygous deletion, which is two copy loss, and then three levels of amplification. Yeah, so, so, that, that's, um, so this is interpreted with a hidden Markov model that adjusts according to the, um, the actual sample. Um, what we'll do in the lab is actually do something much more simple than that, which is arbitrarily um, draw cutoffs of the segment means. Um, and the segment mean is, be, is basically what's the mean of, of all of these data points that are within the same segment. And, um, and so you can look at that and say, okay, well, if that is within um, some number of standard deviations or some number of median absolute deviations, then um, I'm going to call it neutral. But if it goes beyond that sort of acceptable um, neutral band, then I'm going to call it a gain. And if it goes way beyond it, I'll call it a high level amplification. That's a bit of an arbitrary um, uh, thresholding, but um, it's actually often what people do. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, that answers that um, the, the steps between gain amplification and high level. Is there anything that you would uh, suggest? So, so you it. Call it yeah, so it's somewhat arbitrary. I mean, usually large-scale um, chromosome arm events are usually single copy, um, and, and those can are readily apparent, and so we call those gains. Unless so anything more than that, uh, then we'll call an amplification, and then if it's super high and focal, then we'll call it a high level amplification. Yeah, it, it's really, it's a bit of an arbitrary distinction. So that's why model, so model-based hidden Markov modeling 
um, uh, can actually um, uh, help interpret that because it's a principled way of, of actually uh, going through that. All right, so I have 10 minutes to a break. Okay, better keep going. There's a lot more to come. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, um, so, so that was an example of total copy number. Um, and, and here's what the, uh, the B allele uh, fraction looks like. Okay, so, so here we have the same, um, the same tumor genome that's been um, looked at from a, a total copy number perspective. You can see it has a little amplification here. And, and what that does is, so, so again, um, you remember that in a neutral position you get three possible genotypes. And that's, that's um, quite evident here. You get the nice three bands. We have, um, uh, you can call this uh, AA, uh, AB, and BB. Um, here we have our little one copy gain that induces um, additional genotypes. And then this one is really quite interesting in the sense that it, it actually is copy neutral um, in that it's, it's at, it has two copies here, okay? Um, but um, there's a distinct loss of heterozygosity. So that middle band that represents heterozygosity is, is gone. And there's a skewing away from, from heterozygosity into, so this is what loss of heterozygosity looks like. Um, so this is copy neutral loss of heterozygosity. Here you have a distinct deletion in this region, and, and, that, and so that, that also eliminates um, uh, uh, one allele, and so you get loss of heterozygosity here. Okay? So copy neutral loss of heterozygosity and deletion in induced loss of heterozygosity. Yes? Yeah. So, so this is the whole. Uh, this is the whole chromosome. Okay. So, so uh, it, it's unlikely. So that the, you can't have a whole chromosome be be homozygous to start with. That, that's unlikely. Okay. So, so we're looking at. Of course, we're looking at the um, places where we'd expect um, there to be heterozygosity um, at, in in the normal, and then it's lost in the in the tumor. You do have to have heterozygosity to start with in order to lose it. So okay. you say heterozygosity, one from the mother, one from the father, basically. Correct, yeah. yeah. So but you're showing everybody showing the, 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 the upper, one of the parents, the bottom of the lower parent, the middle is both parents, basically. Um, not necessarily. It's really, um, it's the intensity of the major and minor alleles. It, it, it's actually difficult to deconvolute which parent it comes from. Because in one case, the major allele can come from the mother. In a different case, in a different SNP, the major allele can come from the father. So, if, so when, you, when, you, when you have LOH, but you don't have a copy number change, does that mean there's a duplication event? So it means that there would have had to have been um, a loss followed by a, a duplication, yeah, or some misaggregation um, in mitosis, whereby both copies from one parent uh, came, came through in mitosis versus um, uh, proper segregation. And I guess that happens often? Um, in tumors it does, yeah, because they have abnormal replication machinery. That's usually what um, initiates tumor genesis in the first place. And, and in fact, DNA repair um, is, uh, is what's often compromised in tumors. And so this is happening in our cells a lot, but we have the repair machinery to fix things. Um, but tumors have lost that. Okay, so um, very quickly now. Um, so how do you find copy number changes? Let's see. Uh oh. Okay. So there are th really three main algorithmic approaches. Um, one is smoothing, and this is really where we try to just fit a curve to the data. Uh, and then sort of post-process that curve to try to, um, to, to, to try to look at. So, so there's noise in the data, and we want to try to represent, instead of these little, all these little dots that are all over the place, we want to try to re represent it with some sort of mean. Um, regression techniques are often used for this, or wavelet type of smoothing. Um, and, and so you can get a, a curve that represents the data. Um, the, the real disadvantage is this is that, so you end up with a curve, but then you still don't have discrete biology. You have, still have to post-process that to interpret what you have. Um, Another approach is segmentation. This is a very popular uh, approach. 
um, and basically we segment the data into a, an arbitrary number of, of, of discrete levels. And, um, uh, and, and this works uh, quite well to find what we call breakpoints. And so I've indicated here, these arrows represent breakpoints. So here's one segment, here's another segment, here's another segment, and here's another segment. Um, and, and again, however, though, the, the, because it's an arbitrary number of levels, we still have to post-process, and this gets to the question that came early, to actually in, infer biology and, and make a call. Um, then we have um, what I call independent uh, and identically distributed mixture models. Um, this has been proposed in the literature, and essentially uh, what this does is, is it treats each probe independently, but fits a principled um, sort of mixture model to the data. And, and so what it would do is call each probe uh, independently, basically based on where it sits um, in, in terms of the spectrum. And what you can see is that, um, so it would probably, uh, it's very susceptible to these single point outliers. These are likely just machine noise and, not any, and, and don't have biological signal. And then moreover, so, so here um, you'd expect that this whole region should be called uh, uh, together, but basically, again, because it, it kind of amounts to thresholding, um, uh, they would miscall these ones. So, so this doesn't include spatial correlation, um, and so it's, it's extremely disadvantageous for that. Then finally, we get to hidden Markov models, which have been, in recent years, been increasingly adopted in this type of analysis. Um, they have the advantage of, uh, of actually classifying the probes into discrete states. So we go from continuous signal to discrete biology, um, and uh, can, they can model spatial correlation. The output is uh, more or less directly interpretable. Um, however, it does require parametric modeling. It means you have to set parameters, um, and that can be a, a bit of a tricky and arbitrary process at all, as well. So. Um, so we're going to look at, um, in the lab, we're actually going to use this method um, uh, for segmentation and, uh, and then a, a post-processing um, method to, to do that, to call events. So there are some um, examples of, uh, of review papers that go over these different methods. Yes? I have recently started working with cooking up the rice to be something is strange is that previously with microarrays, uh, gene expression microarrays, I mean, and SNP arrays, uh, the definition of each prop was fixed. But here we are looking for regions of gain and insert uh, or deletion, and it's different from sample to sample. That's correct. So how can we compare, for example, two samples to do a kind of association study? So <clears throat> what you can do is you can examine the genes within those segments. And let's say that you have, in one case, you have a copy number change that um, encompasses 10 genes. Okay, it's still small. Um, and, and in another case, you have uh, an overlapping copy number change that, um, that, that may have uh, 15 of those genes, or may only have five of those genes. Uh, so it may be contained, fully contained in another sample within the segment that you found in the previous, first sample. And so, um, so that allows you to actually narrow down the space. Um, and there are tools um, that summarize multiple different segments, uh, uh, segmentation profiles um, to, to find what we call the minimal uh, commonly altered region. And, um, and then that usually helps to refine what genes might be targeted. And then when you go to your association, you do things at a gene level, um, if that's what you're interested in. And, um, and then you can associate the gene itself and not the segment. How the probes are designed, for example, on the FT6 chip? Uh, are they designed on the chip and the gene regions, or how do you? It's everywhere. So some, most are, some are in genes, some are in non-coding regions as well. How do they have a very equidistant? Uh, not, no, not equidistant, but um, they're governed by polymorphic sites. Okay, so that's non, non equally distributed across the genome. Okay. All right. Um, I'm getting the cane. Uh, so I think we'll stop there and we'll take a little break and uh, we'll come back. So in the interest of time, we'll keep going. Um, all right, so I come from uh, the school of thought that, um, that says that really to do analysis to interpret results, um, you should have some sort of understanding of 
what processes gave rise to results in the first place. Okay, so what we're going to go over now is in a bit of detail uh, how two approaches uh, work for segmentation of, of these data sets. So we'll discuss in detail uh, this non-parametric approach, uh, which we call DNA copy or circular bi binary segmentation. Um, the original paper was published in 2004. There's an update, uh, I think a 2007 update. Um, this, there's a nice software package available in uh, Bioconductor um, and basically requires R and integrates well uh, with Bioconductor. And, and so uh, this is actually the approach that we're going to use in the lab. The lab is fully contained within R, uh, and that's why basically I chose this this package because um, uh, just to show just for uh, ease of uh, uh, software. Um, there are parametric approaches um, a, using HMMs, um, some of which I've developed, and there are a number of other uh, tools as well. Um, generally speaking, um, these HMMs are, are not as friendly as, uh, as some of the other packages. Um, however, we are working actively on a bioconductor package for, uh, for one of the HMMs that, that I've worked on. Um, okay, so let's get right into the DNA copy algorithm. So the key ideas here is that um, given this continuous data, uh, we want to find change points in the data. So points in the data where, if, as you're scanning across, um, there's a sharp change in, uh, in, in where the points are falling. So here is quite an obvious change point. Okay, so, so this is, um, and, and then there's really not a huge obvious change point within here. Okay, so, so what we want to do is to minimize the within segment variation. Okay, so, so we want to keep this at a minimum so there aren't a lot of jumps and maximize the between segment variation. So the between segment variation being the mean of the segment. So if this green line represents the mean of all the data points in here. We want to try to maximize the distance between this mean and this mean. Okay? And it employs a concept called circular binary segmentation and, um, and it's a standard of uh, binary segmentation. So let's look at how it works. Um, so let's just look at a, a particular chromosome, and we're going to let uh, y sub t be the log ratio for a particular probe, and then t can go from, from 1 to n, and this is the number of probes in a given chromosome, okay? And essentially, uh, this is just a fancy way of saying um, from position i to j, um, the, the mean is represented by uh, mu sub i j, okay? So that just means it's the mean of the segment. Okay, so let's say um, we are going to now, this is where the circular part, we're going to take this linear chromosome, we're going to wrap it around and make a circle. Okay, and so in that circle we still have our positions and basically we, get, we bring position 1 and position n together. And what we want to find is we want to find the positions i and j that maximize a value. And, and we call that value z i j. And essentially, what a z i j is, it it takes exactly what we uh, discussed earlier, and it looks at the differences between the the means of the segments, and tries to maximize that. And then it penalizes very short segments. So so this this is like a penalty term that says, okay, very short segments um, uh, are undesirable because we know that there should be correlation. And, um, and then this term is just the difference between the means. And so we want to try to find an expression that maximizes um, this quantity here. Yeah, so it's the other bit. That's right. So here's one segment, and this is the other segment. Okay. Um, and then essentially what we do is um, and we look at... Um, uh, permutations of that and we see how often that change point um, actually occurs and um, and then based on the exists so now we may have found two breakpoints and that may take our chromosome and divide it into three sections essentially so we're gonna have this section this section and this section and then what we're gonna do is on all the new segments is just do the same process over and over again basically until we get no more significant segmentations so what the algorithm outputs is segments that have um, some arbitrary number of levels. And basically these red arrows indicate segments. And then when you see a, a change in the mean here, 
um, that that represents uh, this is the end of one segment and then the beginning of the next one starts right away okay so so post-process in the output, as I mentioned, is still required in order to determine copy numbers. So this gives us where the breakpoints are, but we still don't know which ones are gains and which ones are losses. And so there are a number of different approaches, um, such as merge levels um, and median absolute deviation factors, which we'll do in the lab, um, that, that can then take these segments that basically just give you um, the means and then turn those segments into actual copy number calls. Okay. So the other approach, or uh, a complementary approach, is, is using hidden Markov models um, that simultaneously segment and classify the segments. Okay, so so the the segmentation, the breakpoints are found in the context of classification of those segments, and and so the segmentation actually helps with the classification. Classification meaning you want to call a, as a segment as a, a loss, neutral, or gain state. And, and the segmentation helps, helps with the classification and vice versa as well. And classification is done um, at, at, at the probe level into a fixed number of, of states. And, and there are, as I've mentioned, a six state model and there, there are also three state models and four state models. And that's really the, the tricky part with, um, with these parametric models is actually choosing the number of states in the first place. Yeah. So the, the segmentation, what you brought in the last slide. So is that based on the SNP probes or the copy number probes or both? Or does it um, so in the, in the case of copy number, you use all the probes. In the case of LOH analysis, you can only use the SNP probes. I mean, this is really just schematic. In fact, this data comes from uh, low tech array CGH, but the concepts are very similar. Yeah. OK. So. So basically, we want to output the probability that each probe is a loss, neutral, or gain. And so, so what HMMs do is they, they use a model-based parametric approach um, that uh, won't go into the, the details of what a Markov assumption is, but essentially that allows um, calling of the probe um, to be correlated with its neighbor. And so the neighboring probes end up being the same, and you get this nice spatial correlation that takes neighboring um, contiguous segments of probes and, and that ultimately have the same copy number call. So there are a number of tools that, that um, uh, use HMMs, um, and uh, a, a especially for SNP arrays. Um, and so this is really a two-dimensional analysis of B allele and total copy number. And all these four um, uh, uh, methods, I would highly uh, recommend that, um, that use um, these types of methods. Um, they're very sophisticated in their approach and, and try to really um, deal with uh, uh, some of the effects um, that, that come up in, in the cancer settings, in particular OncoSNP and, and this uh, picnic algorithm. OK, so um, this is a table from that uh, review paper that I mentioned. And um, this gives you really a, a really nice summary of the various methods that are out there um, and, um, and, and the experimental designs under which they are uh, appropriate. Um, it describes the uh, detection method and, and then whether they consider these two things that I've already mentioned, which is um, ploidy and um, impurity, which is cellular contamination and normal cell contamination. Um, and so some of these methods have now started to address this issue of, of normal cell contamination. Um, and, uh, and so the field is sort of moving into this area where cancer specific um, problems are being addressed. So it's, it's kind of a simpler version of, of this one here. Yeah. So originally, actually, this algorithm was not designed for SNP arrays, but it's equally um, applicable to SNP arrays. It has been used in many different contexts, including the papers that I mentioned, like um, the, the nature papers um, that describe the somatic landscapes of cancers. Yeah. Right. Yes. So, so in the, in the HMM setting, um, basically there's a, a, 
the inference of the breakpoints and the classes itself is done simultaneously. It's not done in a two-step process. So in the in the the way the approach that we're going to take in the lab is a two-step process. First, we're going to segment the data to find the segments, and then we're going to classify those segments um, as being gain, loss, or, or um, uh, different levels of gain. And um, that can be a lossy process. So let's say the segmentation actually has errors in it. Um, and then in that case, then, then you can't go back and correct that segmentation, whereas the HMM actually um, iteratively um, it, it takes both things into account and, and, and uses the other to help the inference of the of the other, if you will. Um, so the segmentation is informed by the copy number states, and the copy number states is informed by the segmentation. In the case of the discrepancy, which you have the average is 2.4, and the gap is 7.5. Is there a way of telling the algorithm that you want to up the So the HMMs in general can, are usually parameterized, and so the user has some flexibility in terms of setting um, what the means of the different levels should be. And so one can take that approach, and, and, and um, if you uh, think that you know, it's undercalling one way or another, overcalling one way or another, then usually there's a flexibility to adjust parameters to, to account for that. Okay. So, so here's an example of uh, compensating for, um, for segmental aneuploidies and SNP arrays. Um, this is an algorithm called uh, PICNIC. And, um, and, and so changes in ploidy, um, as I mentioned, uh, induce new genotype state spaces. Um, and so here's a, here's a very, uh, this is basically a similar example to what I showed before. Uh, this is from the PICNIC paper itself. And, and basically, um, y you can see that, so what this algorithm does is it takes into account both the, the B allele fraction and the total copy number simultaneously um, and, and basically uh, implements an HMM that, that can segment the data into these different states. Um, compensating for normal contamination, um, there's a nice method uh, called tumor boost. Um, in the, this is in the tumor normal pair setting. So this is where you've extracted some sort of normal reference from the same patient and done two hybridizations uh, of the DNA, one from the tumor, one from the normal. Um, so this is what the B allele fraction looks like before um, adjustment for, uh, for, for contamination, and this is what the signal looks like afterwards. Okay. So, um, so, so there are, uh, basically what this does is it takes the um, SNP intensities uh, from the normal sample and uses that to help inform the inference of the, of the tumor sample itself. And so um, this is, I think, um, an open source, uh, also um, part of the uh, aroma.aphrometrics uh, suite of tools. Okay. So how do you, how do you assess how, much, how many normal cells you have? Like, I guess this is based on some level of inference that you, you have 10, 20, 40. That's right. So that, that's actually what it tries to infer, is, is the level of contamination. Because you can see how skewed the alleles are in the tumor, um, and you know which alleles are actually present in the normal. And so, um, so then you can use expected rates and, and adjust that way. So how yeah. about, um, you know, with published papers with, like, tumor-associated macrophages and whatnot that might carry some of these? Yeah, so, so it gets complex because... Um, um, well, certainly in stromal contamination, um, in, in its surrounding stroma, there's evidence that there are, um, there are somatic signals in those stromal cells as well, and it gets pretty complex. Um, but th so everything that I'm saying is a gross oversimplification of biology, which is we're trying to get at the major concepts, and um, we'll, never get, we'll never get precise modeling. But yeah. Okay. So, so there's just a, an overview of some of the approaches. Um, uh, I would suggest that you know if people are interested, uh, you do some further reading, um, look at the papers that are referenced in this uh, in this lecture, and in the lab, um, uh, there's also a list of um, of PDFs that are there, and and you can look at some of these papers that are there um, for you. Um, so, so one of the tools for visualization of this data is IGB. Um, uh, I believe we're going to get a tutorial on, on IGB. Um, is it now or? Whenever, whenever 
whenever. Okay. Um, yeah. So so um, so in, in about five minutes, um, maybe we can do that. And and essentially, so what this is. Um, so here's an example of of what the um, uh, this population of a thousand breast cancers. Um, this is the RB2 locus, and um, so you can see that's just this small region of chromosome 17 that's being displayed. And IGV essentially represents copy number profiles in a, in a linear track and um, colors amplifications as red segments and deletions as blue segments. And, and so you can see here that um, here's the ERB2 locus and, and, and 